welcome to this episode of Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan, and today I am joined by Jean Sicarella from the Misión de Caridad. Uh, that's what we are mainly going to be talking about today. But I should start with the fact that Jean is a mother of five who lives here in Arlington. And for some people, that might be enough. For Jean, not so much so. So we are going to find out about her passion, her vocation, and the excellent work of Misión de Caridad. Of Ca Misión de Caridad. And I do want to just say right before I turn it over to Jean uh, that this, for some of you, I hope, this will be not the first time you've seen Jean on this show talking about this topic because she visited us a couple of years ago. There was a lot to learn at that point from her and uh, a lot to be inspired by as well. Today, even more so as Misión de Caridad has continued to work uh, do its work and to do it very, very effectively. So, first of all, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it's really Great good to be. see you again. You are, you know, I talk to a lot of busy people. You're right up there. You're right up there. So appreciate you just making the time. No, it's great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, and we do want to get uh, an update on the work that you've been doing and then the, the new additions like the school that you have started there uh, in the town uh, that you are supporting you know, largely supporting in many ways. Uh, but let's first, let's step back and, and look at the larger context. So I'm just going to remind people that Misión de Caridad is a nonprofit that you started, you co-founded with mm -hmm. your co-founder who is in Mexico. It is the town of San Luis, Rio, Colorado, right? Yep. Sonora, um, Mexico. In Sonora, Mexico, just, I think, almost straight south from Yuma, Arizona, yep. and not far from San Diego. So that part of the border, and very, very close to the border, yeah. which has a lot to do with your choices and y your challenges there. Yeah. So let's first talk, uh, topically enough, about border situation. And um, I will just start by saying that I noted um, in some of the materials that you sent um, in preparation for this that you were saying you, you made reference to the number of people and the percentage of people in the town of San Luis who come from somewhere else mm -hmm. in Mexico who haven't been raised in, 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 uh, and living on the border for all these years and it reminded me oh I'll bet that's true for a lot of people with border towns uh, can you tell I know you know a lot about this yeah, so. yeah well a lot of people come to the border from different places. So you have people that come from outside of the country to the border and people that come from within the country. Mm -hmm. So I look at populations of people differently. People that are coming from another country to the border, they pretty much have a sign that says US or bust. There's mm -hmm. not much and not much reason for them to want to stay in Mexico because they set their sights on the United States. Mexicans that come to the border know that their chances of getting permanent or the ability to stay in the United States is much lower than other populations. So they come to the border hoping to improve their lives at the border to be able to take advantage of all the things of being in a border town provides. Yeah, I mean, so that's that's uh, kind of enlightening fact number one for this for this interview is the fact that you know lots and lots of people are coming and that is their destination. Their destination is the south side of the US Mexico border. And why, why, would, why would that be? Well, ultimately, their goal is the United States, but that's not the reality, right? Mm -hmm. Anyone would tell you that they would rather live in the United States. It's a better country for many people, but that's not really an option for them. So at the border, there's more work opportunity. Um, it tends to be more secure than other areas, depending on where you are along the border. Uh, there can be better educational opportunities than what they've faced. It feels safer. There's some places people come from, there's a lot of kidnapping, a lot of violence, uh, just a lot of more cartel violence. And it's not that it doesn't exist where we are, it just exists in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and so oftentimes people come because somebody else in their family has made it at the border on the Mexico side and they come and join their family mm -hmm. is another reason. Um, I want to move uh, forward and talk about, so as I said, you mentioned, you, you, you sent a, a bunch of material um, that's very useful. I actually want to quote directly from it. I'm not going to be reading a whole lot, folks, um, okay. here, but I do want to quote you, you because in response to the question, what does, what does Misión de Caridad do? What, the way that you put it is that we address the root causes of migration by educating children and empowering displaced families to escape extreme poverty on the Mexico side of the border. So 
that's addressing the root causes of migration. You've just described uh, some of that, mm -hmm. um, in fact. But how did this? How did? How did? How did you come to take on this particular challenge? Well, it's interesting. You know, I am a, a believer in if we all do our part somewhere then we make the world a better place. So for some reason, that somewhere for me is there at the border. Mm. Um, I went there on a missions trip with my church, High Rock Church, actually Arlington, mm -hmm. uh, with a bunch of youth in 2016, and I really felt called to go back there. And so I kept going back, visiting for three years, and then in 2019, my co-founder said, I want to start a GoFundMe to help women and children. And I feel like at that moment, something clicked and said, GoFundMe, let's start a nonprofit and let's do more than that. Mm -hmm. And we did. That was when Mission de Caridad was born on February 1st, 2019, responding to, let's start a GoFundMe. And like you just said, to help women and children. And that is, they are the primary constituencies of the services that you provide. It is. Um, and are. deservedly so, obviously. Um, but interestingly enough, just before uh, we started rolling the cameras, you and I were talking about the situation for men and the fact that you are uh, realizing or, 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 or recognizing, uh, again, or perhaps always have, uh, that that you also want to be able to address uh, the critical situation of a lot of men in uh, both San Luis and in other parts of Mexico, obviously. What were you, What just ex explain to our audience what you were referring to in terms of yeah. the things that really uh, men are facing in these contexts that people might not understand. Yeah, well it all comes down to education. So the families that we serve at the border have minimal education. So it would be surprising if we had anyone that's graduated from middle school. The vast majority probably went as high as primary school. And so that really limits your job opportunities for the parent, right? So the parents stay in extreme poverty because they can't really get jobs that would provide enough money to be able to it's just basically day to day, if even that. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons we focus on education because we need to educate the next generation. But the result is for men, there's very limited job opportunities. So they find work, but it's, it's interim work. So maybe they work in the fields for a while, but then that job dries up because the fields shift. Or maybe they do some construction work, but then there's no more construction work in the particular context they have. And so they go on to do something else. So there's a lot of, jump from job to job with no insurance, with no dependability of continuing that job. Mm -hmm. And absolutely no security. I mean, no. in many cases, they are just waking up every day trying to figure out what to do. And so imagine as a male who's, you know, in, in you, within you, is that desire to support your family and you're unable to do that. Mm -hmm. So it ends up being something that really weighs upon the men in our community. As a result, a lot of the men struggle with addiction and other things directly related to the fact that they haven't been able to provide for their family. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting because I hear something like that and I think within the, you know, very rather privileged North American context I operate in, uh, I would think, oh my God, that must lead to certain kinds of, all those stressors must lead to certain kinds of mental health issues that should be addressed, et cetera. And then I'm thinking, they have so many things to deal with before, unfortunately, they can get to that level oh, yeah, of, that's of, not even of care, on the, right? It's yeah, not even on the not radar. It's not even on the radar. It's not even an option. They, right. Those kind of services don't really exist mm -hmm. because the basic services of food and water and housing are absent. Mm -hmm. And so that really is the primary um, Again, you know, I will just say to me, enlightening fact number two or maybe more uh, right there is just, you know, it is, it is simply not on the radar for most people because their concerns are, are so much more basic and, and compelling even. Yeah, well, um, if you would consider your education having ended in fifth grade or third grade and think about all that you learn after that, it's, it's pervasive in everything that you do. How, what, the kind of health you have, your knowledge about what is healthy, your ability to problem solve, a lot of those things really come through all the things you did during your education. Mm -hmm. And in absence of that, it really does leave you ignorant in a lot of areas, and you recognize that, but there's nothing you can do about it. So you've just spoken very eloquently to the deficits in education, in safety, in health, uh, you know, in, in these areas and in San Luis. Misión de Caridad is, has set about uh, trying to do everything it can to ameliorate that. Tell us about, 
it's like the breadth of the programs that you're involved with. Yeah, well, the reality is if you want to educate a child, you have to deal with the pillars that support the child's education, right? So a child can go to school, but if they don't have proper nutrition, they can't focus. If a child lives in a home where when it rains, they you know, have to get up in the middle of the night or they're sleeping in a bed with five other people, they're not getting a good night's sleep, so they go to school, they can't focus. If they don't have the proper health care, i.e. they're not brushing their teeth and their teeth are rotting out, they're in pain, they can't focus, right? So all of those areas we have to really address at the family level, right? We have to say, okay, what are the needs of the family? How do we empower a family to be able to address those issues within their family life so that their child can succeed in school? So we work with families in order to be able to address those issues for the very purpose of keeping their children in school. Because and if we don't, they drop out. Right, and you were saying, you know, if a child, you know, it lives in a house in which the, the the rain comes right through the roof, if a child, you know, cannot, you know, deal with uh, his dental, his or her dental situation, et cetera, you're, those are not ifs, right? Those are those are the those are the children and the families that you are dealing with. It's exactly what we're dealing right? with, and it's not like a this or that. It's actually this and that and that. Mm -hmm. Food insecurity and improper housing and improper medical care. And so all of those things stack up and then the barriers to be able to get to school increase. Transportation, you need money for gas, you need a car that works in order to get to school. And so it all of those things come into play and it's important for us to be aware of and address if we really want to have the success rate of educating children so that they graduate from high school and ideally college. Yeah, and speaking of which, one of the things that has changed since uh, you were last here, hmm. Uh, is the fact that you have started a school in San Luis. And tell us about that, both like what things look like right now, but how that came, you know, how, how you came to be able to do that. Yes, yeah, so we never intended on starting a school. We were running a before and after school program for kids, and we recognized that kids were coming to us after going to school and being in school, and they still couldn't read or write or do basic math, and they were in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, and we said, oh no, this is a waste of time. We need to shift this and we need to provide the schooling. And parents were paying for school in the sense of they had to provide all their school supplies and you know their uniforms for the, well actually the uniforms are paid for. They had to provide all their school supplies and a lot of other things that schools require kids to pay for. Mm -hmm. Actually cleaning, cleaning of the school, parties that the school has, you know, a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes the teachers weren't always at school. So there was a challenge with kids getting an education. So we decided if we really want to fulfill our mission of educating the next generation, we were going to have to do it. So we started in our first year now in August. We started August 19th, preschool through ninth grade. Wow. We have 56 students. We have seven to eight teachers, and we are educating kids. And it's we knew there was an issue, but when you have kids every single day, mm -hmm. we have third graders that still can't write their name. And so we have 16-year-olds who are in sixth grade, and we have eight-year-olds that are in kindergarten. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, so we mm -hmm. definitely had to more align at level and less at how old you are. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. But also, I'm wondering, given some of the numbers that uh, I saw again in materials that you sent, which are absolutely mind-boggling in terms of the Mexican population more generally. <laughs> of, you know, 63% don't, don't finish middle school, six, you know, 93% don't, you know, don't get to college or finish college for sure. Yeah, uh, they don't even get there. These are truly astonishing yeah. numbers. And so that makes me wonder, you say that you started off your very first year with a kindergarten to ninth grade span. Do you have students at those upper grade levels at the moment? Actually, because everybody in middle school is pretty much at middle school level one, which mm -hmm. would be our equivalent of seventh grade. Interestingly enough, of the students that are even past that level, they were kids that were in our before after school program. Mm -hmm. So the only kids that, that are actually higher than that are kids that we've been working with for a few years. Mm -hmm. So no, not yet. The good news is it gives us, gives us time to figure out high school right. because we need a pathway. They're not going to most likely be able to enter into the Mexico public school system because they're gonna be too far advanced. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna need to, really we're gonna need to try to find a private school option for our kids in order to get their high school education. Mm -hmm. But imagine, not only high school, they're gonna be able to go to college. Yeah, yeah. And they, the thing is, they know it. Now they're dreaming. Mm -hmm. They're saying, I could be. 
wait, I want to be a nutritionist. I want to be a doctor. And they know that that dream is a possibility where before there was no hope. Yeah, and I think part of them knowing that is the, is the fact that you have in, incorporated, inculcated, you have a, a, a workforce of 30 on the ground in, in, uh, in San Luis. And I understand that many of them are former what you'd call clients of yours, right? Or, or current people clients. Who, or current, in other words, people who also received the services that yes. Mission de Caridad does. Tell us, tell us just more, a, a little bit more about that part of, yeah. the, of the work. Well, if you want to serve a community, you need to have people within the community be a part of that community. Mm -hmm. And there's no better way to do it than hiring people and training people from within. So a good example is one of our cooks started with us and she had never really been a cook for a large number of people. Now she's cooking for 80 twice a day, which is amazing. Um, but she had never cooked in an oven before. She had never used a blender. <sighs> So we hired her, and we, she started by making smaller meals, right? As we've grown, she's grown. Um, her children hadn't been educated, just her younger one. And now we have her daughter, who is now in middle school. She hadn't been in school for several years, and she actually, we had hired her um, until we made education a mandate. Hmm. So if you want to be part of our program, you as the parent have to commit to seeing your child through high school with our help. Mm -hmm. So it's a mandate. You have to say that that's something that you're you want for your child as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and that brings up another topic uh, that I, you know, I, I, I'm worried that, you know, I'm, I'm constantly, you say something and I'm like, oh yes, I want to talk about that yeah, as well. It does get broad, doesn't time it? Is, yes, time is going to just continue to fly. But, um, but the, that idea that you uh, would attach a condition in a sense to something that you're offering. Uh, you talked about that again before we went on air, the, the absolutely essential importance of not just giving things away to people, yeah. uh, but instead, uh, you know, using that as a, a, as a carrot in most cases, right, to get them to do something that is good for them. Yeah, when you've never experienced something, you don't know. So a lot of kids drop out of school after the sixth grade because none of the parents have ever been to secondary school and they need their children to work and they don't see the value of school. And you can see why. If your child is getting to fourth grade and they're not reading, you're not seeing the value. You may as well put your child to work. Um, but what we recognized, if we could educate our parents to the importance of education and show them what that could look like with our before and after school program and build that trust, now they're trusting us with their children to say, well, this is worthy time, and they're willing to pay for it. It's not a lot, but it's basically what they would pay to send their child to public school. Mm -hmm. They're basically getting a private school education for. But even with that, we had to really educate. This is why it's important. This is what your child is going to learn, and you can be part of that process as an adult. Mm -hmm. So we just had our first back-to-school night, the first ever that our parents have experienced in their entire in their lives, lives yeah. and they just had so much fun. Talk <laughs> about community and the pride of the child bringing the parent in and the dads were there too mm -hmm. and it was incredible and that was our very first and will continue but that's building the groundswell from the parents as well as to the importance of education and they too have hope that there'll be a better life for their children. And there's another, another, another way that you do things uh, that that again in a very kind of stealth way uh, also brings uh, other forms of education and just recognition of how things are uh, mm -hmm. to your population. What I'm thinking of um, is the fact that you uh, that you will um, invite your well, Basically, that you have set up a system where people can see what's what's ahead of them, and 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 therefore be able to dream in the way that you were talking about, and also by uh, you know as an aside, the fact that you present to the parents the, that they're pay they're going to pay for this school, <laughs> um, and they might think to themselves, wait a minute, we don't pay for public school, but then you show them that what you're charging them for, and then you. You show them, you literally show them what you're charging them for. Yeah. And so it's right up front. There's a transparency there yeah. that they are not getting in other parts of no. their life. So it's another way in which they are, again, seeing that there are other possibilities and better possibilities and that they are accessible to them. Yeah. We do what we say. We do it consistently. And we don't overpromise, and we don't give everything away. Hmm. The, our population, our community needs to do something. 
in order to receive. At the bare minimum, they need to show up. Mm -hmm. If they don't show up from the very beginning, we said, well, if you're not here, you may not participate in these programs. And if you don't consistently come, then you can't participate. If you aren't going to educate your child, improve it by having them show up, then you can't participate because we don't have infinite resources. Nobody does. Mm -hmm. So if we're just going to always give, 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 we actually destroy who we're trying to help. If we can empower and teach people to work towards what their goals are by giving them tools and hope, then we can change generations. But if we give, then we demean in a lot of ways. People lose hope because they're relying on you. Mm -hmm. But if you teach them, well, you don't have to rely on us. We're, we're giving you a piece of what you need, but you have to do the hard work. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to get your child up. You have to figure out how to get them to school. And, you know, and we'd love to help families solve other things. But again, we, you know, we can only do so much. And right. Little by little, we expand. One day we'll have a bus. Yeah. But having a bus means our parents aren't dropping off and we won't get to see them every day. So it has its <laughs> disadvantages too. Mm -hmm. You know, because we're working with the whole community, we want our parents to be present. Well, like you said, you can't do everything. No. But let's, let's give the folks a, a little sense of what you do do. Uh, in 2023, here are some key stats uh, from... Uh, Mission de Caridad, and I'm, I, I want to share them with the audience, at least in part, to say this organization uses your money. If yeah. you'll give it to them, they use it well. Yeah. So the, sure. what am I talking about? I'm talking about nearly 60,000 meals worth of healthy groceries going to families in one year, in 2023. 25,000 meals served at the community center. 196 days of schooling provided, 34 Saturday programs with 3,354 attendees at these programs. These programs are health-related, education-related, et cetera. They are they're building community on these Saturdays, right? And uh, c congratulations, by the way, on November 9th, you're going to get to your 100th Saturday, which is And I will be in Mexico. Terrific, and you'll be there it for will. it. Congra and it will be our medical fair as well. So we're going to have a lot of things happening on that one day. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, 100 days of Saturdays is significant. So like you said, I mean, you can't do everything. No. But, man, you're doing a, a whole lot. Yeah. So let me ask you, a, just we're, we're running out of time, but let me ask you to take a half step back and just say, how, how much of all of this stuff is stuff that you have learned, uh, in a sense, by, f you know, continuing to build the plane as you're flying it? Like, how much of it is stuff that you couldn't have anticipated before um, and just learn as you go? A lot. So you learn, you grow, you implement. You learn, you grow, you implement. So we didn't plan on starting a school, but when we saw, we have our goal. We try to keep our goal in mind. And then we look at what's stopping us from reaching our goal. Mm. So right now, a good example is one of the things that's stopping parents from reaching their goal is the medical issues of their children. They can't afford to get good medical care. So now my brain's already thinking, I know some doctors, maybe the doctors would create a fund. It doesn't take away from our budget. It's just a separate fund that maybe could be offered to families that apply just for that fund. So I'm always seeing a need, and as my co-founder and I together, and we are then, as you say, building the plane. And right now, I mean, we have a plane, but we're adding pieces to the plane. Mm -hmm. You know, it flew, maybe it was one of those little pilot prop, prop planes. Prop planes yeah. yeah, and then slowly it became a jet, and then, and it's not, we're not adding bulk to the plane to be able to create luxuries. We're adding necessities to the plane so it flies better and reach its destination more efficiently using the least amount of resources. Nice job. Nice How is job that? Taking that <laughs> metaphor up and, and I won't say running with it, I guess flying with it, right? Um, okay, so I had said just, just now, hey, Mission de Caridad has really got it to, its act together and is a good place for people to, if they're gonna donate, you know, I would, I, I would encourage you to do so, and I would. Um, tell us, you know, tell us how, uh, you know, people's donations, you know, if they want to get involved, yeah. what, what, what kind of money results, you know, yields what kinds of results? So if we looked at, so if we looked at education, what's it cost to educate one child for a month? It's actually $250. Mm. And that might seem like it's high, but we're talking school uniforms, washing them, cleaning them, all the books, materials, school supplies. It's actually pretty cheap if you mm -hmm. think about all that's provided in the kind of education that we provide. Mm -hmm. So at a higher level, it could be $250 at a month. 
at a basic level of, hey, I have $25 a month, well, everything could be used towards something. And it's food, nutrition, education, um, medical care, all those types of things are being covered by that. Yeah, and I know that you guys do, do not uh, run any kind of flabby organization down there. Everything that you get is going, again, as, as, as directly as it can to the services you provide. Well, we have an audited financial, so we actually have an audit firm that verifies our financials. We had our first audit ever this year, and we passed, I would say, with flying colors. Mm -hmm. There was no issues that came up, which is phenomenal. So yeah, yes, we commit. Again. Thank you. Yeah, we commit to being transparent. We have an annual report on our website that anyone can look at to see our expenses, where our money goes. Mm -hmm. And so we want to communicate with our donors and supporters. This is what we're doing. So we have newsletters that go out once or even twice a month, social media. We're always trying to communicate what we're doing and your impact, right? We want to say, this is the impact that you're having, and we want to prove to you, hey, here's how we're using your resources. You have sacrificed to give, and we want to make sure that we're honoring that and using them well. Excellent. And do you have, like, a, you know, people can donate money. Mm -hmm. As again, it's the easiest thing for many of us to be yep. able to do. Uh, but what else? If somebody wants to get involved, what are the what are those options? So I always say to people, I'm always looking to meet somebody who might be interested in learning more about what we do. So mm -hmm. introductions. There's someone, believe it or not, in Arlington that goes around everything free Arlington, mm -hmm. and she finds things that she knows could be helpful to us, oh, and she picks very those cool. up. That has been amazing. So on my front door will show up magnetiles or educational resources. So she's very good at understanding what our needs are. Mm -hmm. It's a funny job, but that's something that she does. Right, right. Um, other people share their talents. They under they know technology well. We can't, we don't know a lot, and we really could use some help. Mm -hmm. So if somebody has technology skill, even just volunteering a little bit of their time could really be helpful to us. Great. So there's lots of ways to get involved. And of course, you're always welcome to visit. We do trips to the border, and so if someone is committed to our mission and wants to learn more and participate, we're happy to have them come down and come on a trip. All right. Well, I, no, no surprise. I really enjoyed <laughs> talking to you yeah. today. And it's, gosh, it's just super important work that you're doing. Um, you're doing it from a long ways away from where the, you know, the action is, so to speak. By the same token, I know you spend a lot of time down there. A lot of your year is spent down in San Luis. Uh, but I am just, I continue to be, uh, let's just say impressed, we'll leave mm -hmm. it at that. Thank you. Continue to be very impressed by what you're able to achieve, um, again, from your home here in Arlington, essentially, uh, and incorporating an ever-expanding number of people uh, to help and to, and, and, and to thrive uh, through Mission de Caridad's yeah. work. So Thank keep you. it up. Thank you. Yeah, really appreciate it. I have been speaking with Jean Sicarella. She is the a co-founder of Misión de Caridad, and uh, we expect to have her back again um, to discuss more of their work uh, in the future. So thank you very much yeah, to Jean for you. her time. Really appreciate it. Thank you to, to you for yours. I'm James Milan. This is Talk of the Town. We'll see you next time.